As we say in Burma, Mingalaba, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure on behalf of the London School of Economics and of the Burma Justice Committee to welcome the panelists and you to this event with a great heroine of our times who really needs no introduction. She exemplifies all that is best, not just about Burma, but also about humanity itself. She has used her life to better the lives of others, and she has done it at great cost to herself. In a famous call to the outside world, which has resonated throughout it, Do Aung San Suu Kyi once asked all of us to use our freedom to help secure freedom in Burma. And more recently, after emerging from long years of house arrest, she called for help in restoring the rule of law. At the Burma Justice Committee, what we have done, apart from calling for the restoration of the rule of law, is to use the law to help political prisoners with cases to the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. But amongst our number are many eminent QCs who have gone to regions blighted by conflict to help in programs of training and education of both lawyers and judges and to put in place an idea of the primacy of law, the idea that the law is king. In a world in which there is so little security, in some senses, what has happened in Burma so far is promising. An internationally respected leader who has been released and who has been permitted to come and speak to us about what assistance we can give her in the great task of nation building which lies ahead of her. We are very honored that lawyers and the law has been one of the first ports of call of this courageous and great lady. Welcome to this round table talk with our distinguished panelists and with Do Aung San Suu Kyi. And I hand over to Well, I can hear from all your claps, there's such enthusiasm in the audience. We, uh, this, this event, at Dorsu's request, is about the rule of law, but I know everybody wants to ask her questions. <laughs> so we're going to have a very short beginning part with our speakers talking about the rule of law. And I will ask them questions very briefly, and I will ask some questions from that have been pre-submitted by people. Um, unfortunately, we have no idea whether the people who submitted the questions are in the audience or not. So I will read the questions. <laughs> and I'm going to start with Nikki Lacey, who, as most people at LSE will know, is one of the great scholars of the rule of law, and ask her to explain how understanding the difference between procedures and substance of the rule of law can be useful for a country like Burma. Thank you, Mary. Um, in the literature on the rule of law, uh, a distinction is often drawn between procedure and substance. And indeed, I think until recently, much of the scholarship on the rule of law saw it as essentially a procedural conception. Um, so that ideas like the equality, of, uh, equality before the law, the in independence and impartiality of the judiciary, the idea that laws must be accessible, intelligible, clear and predictable, these are essentially procedural values. Um, and of course, therefore, consistent with uh, substantively unjust laws. But more recently, I'm thinking here particularly of a, a book published just before he died by Lord Bingham, um, I think we've moved more in the literature towards an idea that the rule of law also encompasses respect for human rights, the aspiration to treat people with person, as persons with dignity, and indeed that uh, it could also encompass compliance with, uh, by the state with international law obligations. And then a third position, 
uh, would be that we should think about the rule of law as essentially a procedural conception, but that nonetheless the discipline of subjecting power to those procedural constraints itself may build in a tendency towards more substantively just law or indeed have its own distinctive value. Now, for various reasons, perhaps for obvious reasons, it's often thought that the procedural conception of the, role of, uh, of the rule of law is of more relevance for countries in transition to democracy. Uh, its formal nature making it more widely applicable. Um, and there's a certain intuitive sense in that, I think. But in my view, it can very easily be exaggerated for two reasons. First, even procedural or formal standards embody values and assumptions of substance. Second, in a sense, it's those underlying values, the ideals of respect for persons, which make the rule of law such a, an important part of the progressive political rhetoric of which you have been such an eloquent exponent. So I'd like to suggest it might be more useful to work with a slightly different set of distinctions. First of all, <coughs> thinking about the rule of law at a very abstract level as a potent symbol on which people with vastly different experiences can identify and which can therefore be highly effective in both motivating political action and solidarity and because of the global reach of these ideas in helping to build transnational alliances. The second level, slightly more concrete, we could think of the rule of law in terms of the, the standards and understandings and values and norms which have gradually developed in international understandings, including in international law. And thirdly, and perhaps most crucially at the moment in Burma, would be uh, our understanding of what the rule of law requires in the specific economic, political and cultural circumstances of a particular country at a particular time. This is the really hard question. How do we design a rule of law appropriate to particular circumstances while still hanging on to the universality of the ideal? And that, I think, in inevitably brings us to the question of institution building. And there was a question, actually, you've rather touched on it, but I don't know if you want to add to that, from Dan Squires of Matrix Chambers, who asked, um, how can Burma learn from other countries' experiences in re-establishing the rule of law? Are there any examples we could learn well, from? I, th I think that really does take us to institution building, doesn't it? And I think here, just one example I'd like to... Uh, to throw in, which would be the example of South Africa. It seems to me that the analogies between the, the position in Burma and in South Africa are, are quite interesting, and that South Africa offers uh, a, a rather positive model for uh, post-transition rule of law. And is it worth thinking about why that is? Um, and first of all, I think that the key factors here are that in South Africa it was a peaceful transition, and reformist aspirations were very widely diffused across the population. And then in terms of process, uh, the move to a democracy was attended by a very wide consultation, which crucially, and again very relevant to Burma, involved all groups thinking about, all ethnic groups thinking about what would look like the right sort of constitution for post-apartheid South Africa. So if we think of what they came up with, there's a tremendous amount of institutional innovation in South Africa, it seems to me. Not just obvious things like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I know you've, you've spoken about, um, but also thinking about the constitution of the constitutional court in both symbolic and material ways, such that um, they've pr produced, it seems to me, a sort of structure, an institutional structure for the rule of law, which is quite distinctive to and appropriate to post-apartheid South Africa. So I think that's a, a, a sort of bottom-up tr transition, which, uh, which suggests that a rule of law sort of worth the name is a rule of law that has to be located within institutional arrangements with a real 
capacity to constrain power, and that means being really firmly rooted in the broader social structure. I think just as a, a footnote, it's also worth remembering that the rule of law is always a work in progress, isn't it? There is no perfect compliance with the rule of law. It's every country is always working, if it's a civilised and progressive country, on improving its compliance with the rule of law. So. Oh, thank you. Whenever you want to come in, you're free to do so. But I was going to move to Geoffrey Nice. I'll listen first. <laughs> I'm going to move to Geoffrey Nice because, in a way, that's a very good transition. <laughs> and uh, I want to ask him about, and, and particularly given the example of South Africa, how important is transitional justice for a substantive tr transition to the rule of law? And what might, form might this take in Burma? Uh, <clears throat> methods of transitional justice are varied from retributive trials through peace commissions, uh, reparation, lustration, uh, memorialization, and so on. Each has its own supporters. N none of them have very predictable results. Not surprising, they're all comparatively recent exercises. Anecdotal evidence might suggest that retributive trials of the kind tried in the ad hoc tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda and also made possible at the International Criminal Court are not very successful, is successful at all in the wider purposes of bringing about reconciliation. Other experience may suggest that peace commissions work best when in combination with other processes, but overall uncertain in their effect. Thus, if a leader decides to change with his past and make the rule of law available, should he be allowed to do that without coming to terms with the past? Can he do that? Theoretically, yes. In practice, no. Yesterday, at an informal tribunal established by the diaspora of Iran to deal here in London with the mass executions of political prisoners in the 1980s, a welcoming address was sent by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And he explained that the passage of time is rarely or never enough, that something else has to be done. And those of us, all of us, whether from speaking with the victims of conflict or whether speaking to people who have suffered personal injustice or even having been the cause of injustice ourselves, know that whatever may be the preferred result of the person who has suffered retribution, vengeance sometimes, or some other solution, he or she will always want to know what happened, how it happened, why it happened. He or she would, of course, prefer the person who was responsible to acknowledge responsibility and even to apologize, for that is finally, or at least it's the best step on the way to the night of peaceful sleep that all are entitled to, including those who suffer in conflict. And perpetrators know, of course, that they must acknowledge what they have done. Sometimes it is fear that stops them doing it, a topic on which I know that you have, I think, yourself spoken. Albert Speer, Hitler's favoured domestic architect, was tried at Nuremberg, convicted, but he escaped the gallows, and thus afterwards, when writing of those events in which he had been involved, likening them to other horrifying events, like the genocide of the Native Americans, said that everyone gets involved, almost everyone, 
and then when it's over says to himself or herself good heavens how on earth could I have done that and it is but a small step from that recognition to the next stage of acknowledgement or apology those who suffer most seek and so in passing from one state to a state where the rule of law uh, is honored the past cannot be overlooked and has to be dealt with but to the second part of the question what can be proposed for Burma that's a very difficult question and those of us who may have been involved in earlier years in making proposals and trying for certain solutions must now recognize that this is an in entirely a matter for the people of the country concerned it has to be their choice not just because as individuals they will want to know what happened to them what happened to their loved ones like the witnesses in the informal tribunal yesterday a top concern being wanting to know where their loved ones were buried so that they can mourn them as a minimum but the combination of the collective knowledge becomes the history or at least one part or one narrative of the history of the people concerned and it is to achieve that amongst other things that there has to be a transition process whether through retributive courts I personally doubt whether when the time is right through a process of a commission I would personally prefer and my last observation is this even if at present the prospect of a transition which can deal with the past may seem difficult or even remote we should all have in mind that the modern age has handed over from national and international bodies that may favor or disfavor processes of transition it's handed over a lot of power to the individual who in the modern information age is far more powerful than he or she ever was both to deal with in transition the process of his own and indeed the process of the collective memory. Thank you very much. And I'm now going to turn to Professor Christine Chinkin and to ask her about respect for human rights, which is, as Nikki told us, such an important part of the substantive rule of law. How can compliance with the international human rights regime be fostered? And in particular, what issues need to be addressed to ensure the rule of law is relevant for women. Thank you, Mary. And as you have just said, and as Nikki referred to, human rights are, of course, part of the sort of substantive values that the international community today embraces and sees as a major starting point. But compliance with human rights is always, I think, for any government, at the end of the day, a matter of political will. And I know there have been discussions recently, it's a matter of considerable debate, whether compliance is better fostered through promises, easing of sanctions, for example, or through threats, the um, threat of further sanctions, imposition, if there isn't um, continued reform. Those are decisions for political um, organs, political institutions. So I was going to also suggest that the legal framework of the UN human rights mechanisms, while they have no formal sanctioning power, nevertheless do have a role to play in fostering an overall environment for human rights compliance. Just to mention um, a couple of procedures of the UN human rights mechanisms. First, Burma, of course, has a very limited um, record of ratification of human rights treaties. But nevertheless, the universal periodic review process before the UN Human Rights Council is applicable to all states. Burma has indeed participated in it. We're now coming to the second round of that process. And it seems to me that if the members of the UN Human Rights Council 
who will be assessing and monitoring the um, review given by the government, if they are prepared to ask hard questions, if they will challenge the government on issues like its insidious denial of human rights violations that took place in the first round of the universal um, peer review process, if they will ask for details about what has happened since, insist upon recommendations being taken seriously, this could indeed be something rather more than just a ritualistic type process. Another possibility, and one that would again depend upon the will of the international community, is a commission of inquiry. Now, not in the sense that um, was just talked about, but rather in the sense of providing an independent um, mission looking at what has occurred, providing at least some record um, with respect to possible commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity that would make denial and obfuscation that much harder and would also provide some basis for um, further action which, as has been said, must be from within <coughs> rather than externally. And a third um, possibility is that the international community through the Office of the High Commissioner has seen national human rights institutions as an important bridge between the international and the um, national. Um, there, ha there has been a National Human Rights Commission created in Burma. It's been very much criticized, I understand, for its lack of independence, for its weak mandate, for its unwillingness to take a proactive investigatory role. But again, if there was greater pressure put on this body to take seriously its role as a human rights promotion body, if it received technical assistance and I think the importance of external support, that might as well act as some body that could work to foster a human rights um, environment. Clearly, they are all flawed processes. Clearly, no one issue is going to be um, effective. But there are a range that can be taken. And what we need, I think, is long-term commitment, drawing on everything that is available in the international community, and again, as, as has been emphasized, working very much from within to see what are the priorities, what people within the country see as the best leverage points to work with. The international community can at least give some support. Women. <laughs> um, women in the situation of the rule of law, a great deal, but um, one can say. Uh, I just uh, stick to one sort of very short point, which is that in reform of judicial institutions that is associated with the reform of the rule of law, it is important that there is secure, ready access to justice for women who are seeking accountability, particularly with respect to the crimes of sexual violence that have been committed against them. The current impunity that is enjoyed by military police security officers inhibits investigation, it prevents prosecution, it undermines any chance of reparation in the broadest sense of the word and contributes, I think, to a cycle of violence which very much undermines the rule of law. Now, clearly, women, as well as men, have endured a whole range of human rights violations. Sexual violence is only one of multiple human rights violations that have occurred. But it has been said, indeed by yourself, I believe, that it has been used, sexual violence has been used as an instrument of intimidation and division. It's been deliberately targeted, particularly in the context of ethnic minorities. And lack of any accountability for these crimes, I think, serves to normalize violence. It continues then in what might be called a post-conflict or a transitional situation and weakens any real transition to democracy in which the entire population can participate. That's really important. Now I'm going to ask you one very quick question, because <laughs> we're run out of time, from Brian Sanderson, a governor of LSE. Some years ago, I was managing director of BP, responsible for Asia. We had to decide whether to do business with the military regime and publicly open an office and invest, or to take a stance on human rights issues in general, and forced labor in particular, and refuse to give the regime credibility. What should we have done, in your view? <laughs> <laughs> in one minute, or uh, one minute, even yeah. less. Uh, a question that raises huge, of course, issues that are pragmatic, legal, and ethical. 
Um, rather than look at the past, I think I might just refer very briefly to the fact that this is an area where there's been a great deal of thinking within the international community. Notably, the work of John Ruggie with respect to business and human <coughs> rights, who has been seeking to develop tougher standards for corporations, giving them the questions that they should ask before making um, decisions of that sort. And Ruggie has emphasized that alongside the obligation on the state to protect human rights, which of course the state was failing to do, there is a separate and independent obligation on corporations to respect human rights, irrespective of the national situation. And this requires the company to ask itself questions about the impact of its activities on human rights in the area, to have an obligation of due diligence to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how they, the company, address the impact of actions on human rights within the area in question, even though the abuses may be being committed by others. So that requires, I think, a long, hard, honest look by corporations to look at the context of the proposed actions, look at the likely impact on the authorities, look at the likely impact on the people, notably minorities, displaced persons, which are very often um, the situation. Might also add, of course, that they might take into account the potential for legal action, depending on knowledge, constructive knowledge, level of activities, with respect to complicity, even complicity in war crimes. And then, of course, there's also moral complicity, which I think flows from implicitly, at least, supporting the acts of the government. But I'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, finally, we have Zani who is a visiting fellow at the Civil Society and Human Security Research Unit, which I direct. And I'm going to put directly to him some questions which were actually put to Dorsu, but I'm going to put the pre-submitted questions to him. And the first one is from Amal de Chichera of the Equal Rights Trust. <coughs> Stateless people around the world require the protection of their home countries and of the international community in order to live secure and dignified lives. The escalating conflict between Rohingya and Rakhine in North Rakhine State is a sad reminder of the extent to which stateless persons are vulnerable to human rights abuse. What steps could be taken to integrate the Rohingya and other stateless persons into Burmese society to prevent conflicts of this kind recurring in the future and to ensure they have a role to play in the country's journey towards democracy. And a question from Peter Bamford, I'm not going to read it all because it's rather long, uh, but basically he says that when he spoke to the military, one of the main justifications for military rule was that without strong military rule of the country, it would break up into different ethnic groups. So um, what are, ha, um, and was Burma, he asks, an artificial creation of the former imperial leaders, and how could civil democratic government overcome such entrenched ethnic divisions? Yeah. Um, let me preface my uh, response by saying that I'm speaking uh, not only as a scholar and activist, but as a Burmese, um, formerly stateless myself as a refugee for 15 years in the U.S. traveling on refugee document. So I know from my experience the, the type of vulnerabil vulnerabilities that uh, stateless people, you know, f uh, far more downtrodden than I ever was, um, experience. At least, you know, um, that's um, where I'm coming from. Uh, I think the most important thing on the statelessness is to understand the stateless statelessness as something produced by the state, not by the people or community. We need to make a very clear distinction. Statelessness is a product of states, not the communities and people. Of course, like the states may mobilize ethno-religious uh, prejudices or in some cases hatred uh, in order to uh, advance its political calculations or ends. But, you know, fundamentally, state statelessness is the uh, the problem that is created by the state. And it, in some ways, it's similar to, um, you know, uh, our dear friend, uh, Johan Galton, um, uh, 
conceptualized you know, poverty as structural violence. Actually, statelessness is the structural violence. And this is where the domestic you know, societal tendencies as well as illiberal regimes and uh, in, you know, um, somewhat uh, backward international conceptions of you know, uh, what people are or communities are. And let me just explain. In, in, in the specific case of the, the Burmese uh, or, or Rohingya people, you know, and, 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 and a lot of people question where they come from or who they are, who they, you know, like uh, who is Rohingya and who is not, who is Bengali, who is, are they uh, con to be considered a nationality or have they been stripped of the nationality standing that they got, you know, uh, back in 1950s. So, so those questions aside, I think this is the area where larger universal principles of human rights and human dignity come into violent conflict with domestic national sovereignty conceptions and ideas. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 15, <coughs> it is very specifically say, stated that every person uh, will have a right to a nationality. In other words, every person will be granted just by the mere fact that he or she is a human being, a place of belongingness. And then a statelessness is it's basically about people without soil underneath their feet, uh, as it were. Yeah? And then so I think, as a Burmese, um, when I read or like, you know, hear news about the stateless um, Rohingya people, my immediate question is like, you know, why are they treated not as human beings, but as hunted, fugitive, unwanted, undesired on our soil. Especially, I think it is very disturbing as a Burmese as well, uh, with um, you know, a, a profound Buddhist upbringing. We're a society that is supposed to thrive on and build ourselves on the principles of compassion. And why is it that you know, we who have fought so hard and still yet to accomplish the institution of human rights uh, in our country, unable to extend that uh, you know entitlement to this population, and then, yeah, and I think on on the practical question of like you know how do we move forward? Well, the way to move forward is not to multiply more nationalities. We already have 130 because it's convenient for the military regime to have so many because all uh, authoritarian regimes resort to the old divide and rule, and and so we don't. I, in my personal opinion, I don't think we should, uh, you know, support the claim, uh, clamor for granting Rohingyas a nationality. However, categorically, we should support initiatives that would ensure the dignified treatment of this population, you know, citizenship, uh, permanent residency. And finally, um, I think the Burmese society, uh, the Burmese human rights community itself has to come to term with the fact that there are illiberal tendencies within our own movement, our own society. It's you know, nothing to be you know, uh, ashamed of. We must not deny that there are illiberal tendencies within our own society, not just the illiberal regime. And so I think a useful principle would be human security as a notion. We need to understand that security and well-being of individuals and communities uh, are equally, if not more, important than the national security. I'll stop. That's great. And I also, it, it, a wonderful answer too. Um, and I also want to ask. <laughs> a a, a follow-on question, um, which comes from Dr. Jonathan. Oh. Uh, the military bit. Bonitia. <laughs> To what extent have grassroots environmental movements, for example, the campaign against the um, Myatzone Dam, provided a way for communities to assert their rights against the government of Myanmar? Well, I mean, like a, a lot of you would know that Myatzone Dam was a three billion US dollar project that was um, you know, uh, instituted jointly by the Burmese regime and the uh, Chinese um, electricity company. Uh, along the, uh, the lines that electricity should be traded across national boundaries. That this is all part of this like free marketizing Asia. You know, the formerly communist or leftist uh, countries are now under pressure to open their borders for trading everything from like, you know, drinking water to um, natural gas and uh, electricity. And so this is the issue that had galvanized that people 
like a Dosu herself, as well as the grassroots communities across all sectors, including within the uh, the Burmese regime, and then so there are you know this issue, uh, the successful campaign to at least get the Misson Dam project suspended. Um, you know, indicates that the Burmese society there, despite its flaws, uh, is capable of coming together for a common purpose. So that defeats the, uh, you know, that refutes categorically the military's claim that, uh, you know, people are so divided, ethnic divisions are so entrenched, therefore, the mili only the military can keep this country with an iron fist in order for the country from um, balkanizing. Yeah, and, and over the past 50 years, my com final comments is that uh, the military has 50 years of opportunities to resolve you know, any type of ethnic conflicts. And you know, the, the civilian po um, parliamentarians only had one decade to resolve the ethnic conflicts yeah, and political conflicts. And the military has failed to make the best use of their 50 years in power. And in my uh, personal view, because of their totalitarian or neo-totalitarian orientation, the military isn't after peace on equal terms. They are after peace on their own terms. So, you know, that's, as, as I speak today, there's war going on in northern Kachin state between the Kachins, you know, who had uh, 14 years of peace deal with the military, and, 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 and these wars are n not simply motivated by ethno-nationalistic sentiments. There is a political economy or conflict there. If you look at the min so-called minority areas, those are the areas that are very rich in resources and that are considered buffer states by the central state. And so I think this is a very, very uh, important issue. And we must not buy into this concept that the millet, only the military can hold the country together. Thank you very much. And now, finally, we come <laughs> back to Dorsu, which everyone has been waiting for. Would you like to comment at all on any of these points? Uh, yes, the theme of this uh, discussion today is rule of law. And I think it was very, very good that we started with Professor Lacey, because what you said about procedure and substance, I think, can be used as a basis for addressing all the other issues that have been discussed. Uh, you mentioned the fact that procedure is particularly important in times of transition. And this is so because it's through procedure that you can see whether justice has been done, seen to be done. So this is very important. And substance is also important because, of course, there are laws in Burma which are obsolete, which are not suited to the times, and these have to be addressed. Now, transition, we, you were talking about transition, and that goes with procedure. How, what kind of procedures are we going to use? You mentioned the fact that time will not heal, that Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, the time will not heal. There has to be acknowledgement. And how is this acknowledgement going to, make, to, to be made? That is a procedural matter. What sort of procedures are we going to follow? Are we going to go for a commission of inquiry of the kind perhaps that, that will be uh, started by an external body such as, as the United Nations Commission for Human Rights? Or is it something that is going to be internal? These also are procedural matters. How are we going to handle these issues? Now, even the, uh, the discussion of uh, statelessness in Burma, we can base it on rule of law. There are two aspects to this. First, the laws of citizenship. Are then that substance? What are the laws of citizenship in Burma like? Are these just? Are these in line with internationally acceptable standards? So that is one issue. And the other is procedural. How do the immigration authorities work? How do the police work? How do the courts work? These two together are essential if we are to find out exactly why stateless persons are stateless and whether there is not something that can be done to assure their position within the rule of law. So the reason why I've emphasized rule of law so much in, in my uh, political work is because this is what we all need if we are to really proceed towards democracy. 
unless people see that justice has been done, as unless justice is, is done and seen to be done, we cannot believe in genuine reform. We have to know that reform is based on rule of law. Reform should be applied equally. Reform should not uh, be used to protect a certain group or to promote another group. This is why, even with the Misson Dam, there, I think, uh, it's a, a little different from rule of law. It's more good governance. But I think you have to link good governance to rule of law. You can't divorce one from the other. With the Misson Dam project, we don't know exactly what's in these contracts that have been drawn up between the Burmese government and Chinese business. And this is where the problems begin. The people only knew after the work had started that they didn't like what was going on. But the fact that uh, this project has been suspended for five years certainly does not bring an end to the problem at all. What happens at the end of five years? What is in those contracts? I don't know. And I think the great majority of people in Burma do not know. And I think that there, although in a way you could say that this is, this is to do with good governance, that is to say transparency and accountability, you could say that it has something to do with rule of law as well. How under the law a government should proceed with regard to contracts with foreign uh, enterprises. And you talked about investment. I've spoken recently about democracy-friendly, human rights-friendly investment. I think investors must take responsibility for the results of the business that they do inside our country. It's not just environmental consciousness, but also a consciousness of long-term results, of possible long-term results. For example, we, are very, we want to encourage investment that will create jobs because unemployment is a big problem in our country. And we also want to promote the kind of investment which will bring in vocational training, train the people to take up the jobs that will be created. Because of our extreme, extremely poor education system, our young people are not trained to find employment. There's no employment to begin with, but even if jobs are created, the great majority of our young people just can't go into them straight away. They have to be trained to take up these jobs. And the, the, uh, the kind of uh, scrutiny that is needed with regard to foreign investment can also be linked to, the, to rule of law. In fact, it is linked to rule of law. We cannot escape from rule of law. We, this is the main, uh, this was the main Pla uh, plank of our election uh, manifesto, for our by-election manifesto, rule of law, end to ethnic conflict, and amendments to the Constitution. The reason why we put rule of law first uh, is because we do not think that we can achieve the other two without the foundation of rule of law. Because ethnic conflict has a lot to do without, uh, uh, with lack of justice, and of course justice is linked to rule of law, and amendments to the Constitution. If we are to meet the aspirations of the ethnic nationalities, this Constitution will have to be amended to, uh, to harmonize with those aspirations. Uh, th this present Constitution does not harmonize with our aspirations, that is to say we who are not, uh, we are ethnic Burmese, but who wish for a democratic constitution, nor does it harmonize with the aspirations of the other ethnic nationalities who are minority in the sense that they're fewer, fewer of each, other, each of the uh, other nationalities than are of the Burmese ethnic nationality. Uh, unless we amend the constitution to harmonize with the aspirations of all, all of the people in our country, we will not, never be able to bring about the kind of unity and peace that we all desire. So it all comes down to rule of law. Amendments to the Constitution, of course, is very much to do with law. It's to do with substance as well as procedure, because amendment to the Constitution is to do with procedure. Uh, and uh, we have a very, uh, uh, a very rigid uh, uh, Constitution, whereby to, have, to make any amendments 
more than 75% of the uh, members of the National Assembly must agree to these amendments. Now, since 25% are military nominees, that means that all the civilian uh, members of the National Assembly must agree, plus at least one military officer. <laughs> uh, but don't forget that the great majority of the civilian members of parliament are from the USDP party, which is the party created by the previous military regime. So you can imagine how difficult it is going to be to have the constitution amended. Perhaps then you might want to ask me, then do we think it can be amended? Yes, we think so, because we think that it is pos possible to work together with the military to make them understand why we think that this constitution uh, will not uh, move us in a positive direction. By us, I don't mean the National League for Democracy, I mean uh, the whole country. So that the, the reason why I ask that rule of law be discussed today is for all these other reasons, that the progress that we hope to make uh, with regard to democratization and reform depends so much on an understanding of the uh, understanding and acceptance of the importance of rule of law. Well, thank you very much. And um, that's a good thing. We should continue this discussion somehow, yes. somewhere. Yeah. Uh, we just have time for two questions from the floor. That's all <laughs> we've got time for, unfortunately. So um, could I see who would like to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> there are hundreds of people and I can't... Well, they're the one with the spectacles. Okay, the one with the spectacles who's waving at me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I feel so p privileged to ask you some of my present questions. Could you say who you are? Oh, it's sorry, nice yeah. to know. Yeah, my name is uh, Kunong. Um, I'm a Kachin ethnic and from Northern Burma. So, um, um, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, as uh, you have said, uh, the democratic reform, reform should be comprehensive, um, not to be, you know, you know, just on one part, on why, you know, the, the war is going on in the other part. <coughs> so, um, my, my question is, as, um, as someone, you know, um, who, who wrote uh, Freedom from Fear uh, and being a symbol of courage, and uh, the non-resistance movement at home and abroad, um, why are you reluctant to uh, publicly condemn the military, Burmese military uh, <coughs> regime's uh, military of, uh, offensive against Kachin civilians, which has resulted in 80, you know, more than 80,000 um, <coughs> uh, Kachin refugees and RDPs on the Kachin, and bar uh, Kachin China border? And another related and question. I think, well, that's a big question. <laughs> All right, well, let me answer this. When you say that, why don't I condemn the military? I condemn all violence, not just on the part of the Burmese military, but on the part of all other groups that's going for violence. We have said very clearly with regard to the fighting going on in uh, the Gachin state that to begin with, we need independent observers to find out what is actually going on because there are different accusations coming in from different directions. We stand very much with the people of the Kachin state. Uh, I was telling uh, the members of the Burmese community whom I met this morning that one of the good things that has come out of this conflict is how supportive the ethnic Burmese are of the Kachin refugees. It's not just my party, but individual Burmese and individual Burmese organizations which have been putting together uh, the funding to send to the refugees because they sympathize so much with them. But when it comes to condemnation, we want to know what's happening more clearly before we condemn one party or the other. The fighting is not just taking place on one side. I understand that Burmese military forces have gone into territory which previously was agreed to be uh, under the supervision of the KIO. But when we asked what the, uh, what the, how, how the matters stood, when we asked, uh, for example, the UN 
uh, High Commission for Human Rights when we asked the United Nations agencies. They said they cannot say for sure because they have not been allowed to go in as independent observers. So resolving conflict is not about condemnation. It is about finding out the roots, the causes of that conflict and finding out how it can be resolved in the best way possible. Now, one last question from the lady at the front. The front most one. <laughs> Um, Rachel Goldwyn, a former political prisoner in Insane. Um, my question is about how can the international community support the creation of a space to discuss the reform of the security sector, being both the Tatmadaw and also of the ethnic armed groups? Good question. Good question. Uh, do you, by the security sector, do you mean the military as well as the police? Well, this, this will have to be part of the whole reform of the system. There are good rules with regard to both the military and the police. It's just that the rules have not been followed. For example, uh, the military has, as you all know in the past, been, uh, been guilty of shooting civilians. Now, if we consider the laws of Burma, there is such a thing as aid to civil power, which lays down very clearly under what circumstances the military can come in to control civilian crowds. But these laws, these rules and regulations have been totally ignored. So it's not just substance, it's also procedure. And what kind of space, do, by space do you mean that not um, civil society organizations discussing the matter, educating the military forces, educating the police forces. It's a very broad subject. You, you, civil service society organizations certainly will not be allowed to go in and educate the military, that I can tell you. But I think we can do a lot of work uh, with regard to the courts of justice and to the police forces. And I think the international community could help by offering uh, proper training for police officers. That is a one practical way of going about it. Well, gosh, we could keep discussing these things for such a long time. I'm going to ask you one last question that was sent to me that came from a student uh, called <coughs> Lena, I don't know where she's from, Gatas Bultaif, and she says uh, in her question, what is the source of strength to keep you fighting for Burma? <laughs> Well, you, I suppose. <laughs> I, during this journey, I have found great warmth and great support among peoples all over the world. This journey didn't start on the 13th when I came to Europe, but on the 29th of last month, month when I went to Thailand. And I was surprised and very touched by the warmth with which the Thais welcomed me as though I were one of them. And this I have found in <coughs> Switzerland. Uh, in Norway, yesterday evening in Ireland for a brief six hours or so, and now here in England. So I think it's all of you and people like you who have given me the strength to continue. And I suppose I do have a stubborn streak in me. <laughs> <laughs> everybody and do you realize that today and it's so nice of Dorsu to come it's her birthday <laughs> 67. I know, the, I know that you don't want to hear from me, uh, but uh, can I do one housekeeping thing before I give a vote of thanks, and that's to say, after the event, could you please stay in your seats 
so that the platform party can actually get out. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I've enjoyed the event and I hope I can speak for everybody uh, here. Uh, I want to thank every one of the people on the panel for their uh, thoughts and insights into this very, very important issue. And I hope the other panelists will forgive me for focusing a little on <laughs> Daosu. Right. So we are uh, very honoured and very pleased that you were able to accept the invitation to uh, be here in what I know is a very, very busy uh, schedule that you have. Uh, your trip linked to the UK uh, will go, go down in history and I'm sure it's probably quite an emotional trip uh, for you. Yeah. Um, at LSE, when we have distinguished guests, we always do two things. And I'm going to ask Alex here, who is the Secretary General of the uh, Students' Union, to present you first with two things and then something a little special. So the first thing is the official uh, cert certificate uh, of this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The second thing, and don't ask me why we do this, but it started with Nelson Mandela and every distinguished guest since then has been given a baseball cap. However, we don't end it there because um, uh, today, as Mary has told you, it is Dasu's birthday. And we found a picture taken of your father when he was in London in 1947. And I don't know whether you will have seen it before, uh, but we certainly thank our friends at the uh, British Museum and also the library. <laughs> everybody in this room is conscious of how many birthdays uh, Daosu uh, <laughs> spent uh, not free. And so uh, it's a great joy today that she does spend this birthday in freedom and with us. Okay. Um, we are also, I think, very conscious that uh, Burma has started on a long road and as you I think reminded everybody in Stockholm uh, the transition is going to take some time before there is the rule of law and justice for all. We are going in a minute to all of us sing a happy birthday <laughs> to you <laughs> and we would like that not to be just a tribute to you, but to all those people who have campaigned for uh, freedom uh, within Burma and for all of the Burmese people. So, can I ask you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was my fault. To, <laughs> to thank Ansi An Shu Chi and to stand up and sing. Now, <laughs> Yesterday, Bono apparently um, <laughs> sang to her. Now, we might not have quite that star quality, but let us see whether can, we can be even more robust. And thank you. Thank you. There's the music.
I do. It was wonderful. I was amazed that in this moment, I was so busy for me in the morning. I was looking at the cost of the lunch of the kids. I knew that the kids had some wild and wild as well. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.